Hello my friends. Invasive animals have always been a problem for the government and farmers in the United States. In addition to common invasive species such as wild boar, white-tailed deer and coyotes, agriculture and the natural landscape in the United States is also affected by a multitude of other invasive species such as swamp rats, Canadian geese, beaver, raccoons, wild turkeys and wild horse. To limit the negative effects of invasive species, the US government often encourages affected people to use measures such as habitat destruction, trapping or hunting these invasive species to the extent permitted. These are Canadian geese, one of the most common wild geese in the United States and North America. It is estimated that there are at least 7.3 million Canadian geese living in the United States today. And they are wild animals that cause quite a bit of trouble for farmers and the US government. In the beginning of March to the end of May every year is usually the time when Canadian geese nest and lay eggs. The nests are often made right next to water bodies such as lakes or swamps. On average, each female Canadian goose usually lays about five eggs and the eggs will then be incubated for about 25 to 32 days depending on weather conditions. For Canadian geese, incubation will be done by both male and females. Immediately after hatching, these geese are able to forage on their own and their diet is similar to that of adult geese. In recent years, California, Oregon and Minnesota are the states that regularly record large numbers of Canadian geese coming in to nest and breed. The stems and shoots of the grass are the favourite food of Canadian geese. Therefore, it is very common to see flocks of Canadian geese roaming the grasslands in the United States. The fact that dozens or even hundreds of Canadian geese feed on the grasslands is also one of the problems that concerns many people because they leave while feeding is quite dirty. Young Canadian geese will live with their parents for about a year before becoming independent and they will need to about three months to learn to fly and be ready to migrate with the flock. In the wild, baby geese are the preferred prey of carnivores such as foxes, coyotes and crows. Currently, due to rapid urbanization in the United States, spacious manicure grasslands and artificial ponds are often the favorite place of the geese. The fact that dozens or even hundreds of geese live right next to human habitation has caused many problems, and this is why they are considered one of the invasive species of the United States. Geese are prolific and indiscriminate poopers. These geese will poop once every 20 minutes, and on an average day, each adult goose will poop up to one and a half pounds of poop. Having a flock of a few dozen Canadian geese living in a park would cause much of the park's grasslands to be destroyed. In addition, their droppings will make lakes and grasslands quite polluted.
This not only causes problems in artificial grasslands and lakes, but flocks of Canadian geese can also be dangerous for flights. It is estimated that every year around the world, there are about 1,200 plane crashes involving geese. At several golf courses in the United States, workers employ drones to scare away the geese before the matches are played. When it comes to the problems of Canadian geese, we cannot ignore the noise pollution that this animal causes. During the breeding season, the geese will fight with each other for the right to mate. And this is the time when they honk continuously. If you are unfamiliar with these sounds, chances are you will get annoyed and want to do something about these geese. Every September and October, thousands of Canadian geese fly south to avoid the cold. During the migration, the geese may stop at grass fields to replenish their energy before continuing to fly. This is also a big problem for grain farmers because thousands of geese can cause significant damage to their crops. Currently, there are many solutions to deal with Canadian geese in the United States. In particular, they allow hunters to kill geese as a solution that has received a lot of agreement from people who are not sympathetic to this animal. Catching and butchering the geese is a short-term solution that is implemented. Late June and early July is usually the time when Canadian geese molt. This is also the time when they cannot fly. Therefore, it is very easy to gather and catch them at this moment. Many charities do this in the United States and the goose meat is then distributed to needy families. Next, we will go to the US state of Louisiana to see how dealing with thousands of swamp rats works. The swamp rat, also known as the Nutria, is a large 20 pound rodent that lives in the coastal marshes of Louisiana and is now a widespread throughout the southern United States. Swamp rats are considered an invasive species because they often eat the roots of plants in the swamp to the point where they don't have a chance to regrow. They can feed on large swaths of marsh overnight, leaving empty water in their path. According to the United States Wildlife Service, an adult swamp rat can give birth to 40 to 60 young per year. This makes the population of this animal always a threat to the ecology of the wetlands. Currently, many parks in Louisiana have an abundance of swamp rats and the visitors often have a habit of providing food for them. However, as recommended by animal experts, the act of providing food for swamp rats can cause their numbers to increase rapidly and this will harm the landscape of the park. To deal with this invasive species, trapping and hunting are the two frequently used solutions.
to encourage people to exterminate swamp rats. The Louisiana government agreed to a $6 reward for each swamp rat killed. After hunting the swamp rats, hunters will cut off their tails and bring the tails to receive the reward. In addition, authorities in the United States are also encouraging chefs to add swamp rat meat to their menus to reduce the number of this invasive species quickly. In addition to Canadian geese and swamp rats, Wild horses are also considered a problem for cattle ranchers in the United States. Wild horse populations have demonstrated an ability to grow at 18 to 20% per year. Widespread and overabundant feral horses wreak havoc on the rangeland ecosystem by overgrazing native plants, exasperating invasive establishments, and out competing other undulates. Cattle ranchers in the United States are the ones most affected by the feral horse problem. To solve the wild horse problem, the Bureau of Land Management gathers and removes feral horses from public lands to protect the health of animals and the health of the nation's public lands. In some locations, the Bureau of Land Management also uses contraception to slow the growth of wild horses. Hello my friends, today we are going to the eastern US state of North Carolina to see how farming and livestock work here. From majestic mountains to coastal plains, North Carolina's agriculture can be described in one word, diverse. Farming and agriculture has always been an important part of North Carolina's economy throughout the state's history. In recent years, North Carolina's agriculture industry has contributed between 77 and 83 billion dollars to the state's economy. According to the USDA statistics, as of mid-2022, there are approximately 47,200 active farms in North Carolina, and this number is about 6,300 farms less than in 2017. Today, the average farm size in North Carolina is about 181 acres, and the state's total farmland is 8.4 million acres, or about 27% of the state's total area. In recent years, operations on farms in North Carolina have been mainly pig, turkey, broiler, sweet potato, cucumber, bell pepper, and tobacco farming. In addition, salmon fishing is also a quite famous profession in this eastern state. This is a deer farm in Ashe County, in the northwest of North Carolina. There are about 130 deer raised for the purpose of meat and deer velvet. The end of April to June each year is usually the breeding time for the deer raised on this farm. And on average, a female deer usually gives birth to two to three young. Newborn stags weigh an average of six to eight pounds. In the wild, they are considered the favorite prey of predators such as coyotes, brown bears, and wildcats. After about two weeks of living on the farm, the young deer will go 
with their mother to the grasslands and forest next to the farm to feed and play. According to statistics from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, there are about 37 active deer farms in the state and the number of deer raised on these farms is about 5,700. The number of deer raised in North Carolina is very small when compared to the number of deer in the wild and in the state sanctuaries. It is estimated that in North Carolina there is about 1.1 million deer living in the wild and protected areas. Unlike deer that live in the wild, most deer raised on a farm in North Carolina are vaccinated at an early age to control certain diseases that can be transmitted to humans, such as Q fever or tuberculosis. This is another deer farm in Mecklenburg County in Western North Carolina. There are about 120 deer living here, including about 23 male deer. In the late afternoon, this ranch owner will use hay and some nuts to feed his deer herd. According to estimates by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, Mecklenburg is the county with the largest deer population in the state, with about 31,000. This population includes both wild and farm-raised deer. This is a rabbit farm in Caswell County, North Central North Carolina. There are about 200 rabbits raised in the farm of free range and they can freely run and dig in the fenced area. Every day, the owner of this ranch will use some nuts and peanuts or sweet corn to feed hundreds of rabbits. And most of the rabbits on this farm are raised for the purpose of harvesting meat. Currently, there are about 40 rabbit farms in operation in North Carolina. And the number of rabbits raised on the free range is only a small number. This is another rabbit farm in North Carolina, where hundreds of rabbits are kept in cages and they hardly see the sun in their entire lives. After reaching a weight of around 10 pounds, hundreds of rabbits at this farm will be shipped to rabbit meat processing plants. With more than 20,000 rabbit meat producers across the country, each year the United States consumes about 8.3 million pounds of rabbit meat. In the United States, approximately 890,000 rabbits are slaughtered each year. Of these, about 112,000 were slaughtered in Pennsylvania. Goodbye Livestock Farms, we will now go to a Christmas tree farm in Henderson County, North Carolina, to see how the process of cultivating and harvesting thousands of Christmas trees here takes place. Early spring is often the time when thousands of Christmas trees are moved from nurseries to farms to start a new life. Currently in North Carolina, there are about 850 Christmas tree growers on an estimated 41,000 acres. And this is also the state with the second largest number of Christmas trees in the country, with about 4 million trees. Leading the list is Oregon with 4.8 million trees. Christmas tree planting time usually lasts from four to 10 years depending on the cultivator. In North Carolina, the Fraser fir is the most commonly grown Christmas tree, accounting for 90% of the state's Christmas tree production. It usually takes about seven years to become eligible for the harvest.
This is what happens at the Christmas tree farm when the harvest season begins. Here, thousands of Christmas trees will be cut and delivered to the gathering place. Currently in the United States, there are about 15,000 Christmas tree farms with an area of around 295,000 acres of land use. In recent years, the output of Christmas trees harvested across the country has always fluctuated between 21 and 25 million trees per year. After harvesting, thousands of Christmas trees will be transported to the gathering place by truck. Some farms will actually use helicopters to transport trees. Each year, the Christmas tree industry in the United States creates about 100,000 jobs and the revenue from the sale of Christmas trees is about $383 million. When it comes to North Carolina agriculture, we certainly cannot ignore the large scale sweet potato farms in this state. According to statistics, in 2021, in North Carolina, about 46,000 acres of farmland is used to grow sweet potatoes, and the annual production of sweet potatoes in the state is about 771,000 tons, accounting for 43% of sweet potato production in the country. Each year, in August to October, is the time when thousands of migrant workers flock to sweet potato farms in Northern Carolina to harvest. And the average salary that they receive is at about $11 per hour. Here is the process of harvesting at another sweet potato farm in North Carolina. Here, millions of sweet potatoes will be harvested by this modern machine instead of migrant workers. The sweet potatoes harvested here will be stored in wooden crates before being transported to the packing factory. And this is what happens at a sweet potato packing plant. Here, millions of sweet potatoes will be washed and dried before packing. In addition to sweet potatoes, North Carolina is also the leading state in the country in terms of tobacco production. According to statistics, in 2021, tobacco production in North Carolina is about 184 million pounds, accounting for 48% of tobacco production in the country. Ranking second in this list is Kentucky with 107 million pounds, accounting for 27% of output production nationwide. <music>